So each time I mention one of the parts of the nativity that we've just seen acted so brilliantly, um, I want your table to call out the, uh, the right line um, as we go around. So we're going to do um, a practice um, to get into it. And uh, it's a bit like fancy dress this. So the more enthusiastic you are on your table, actually it's less painful. So I've got them on a list here, right? So we'll go first with star. Yes. Shine bright like a diamond. Right. Um, Baby Jesus. Yeah, Emmanuel, God with us. Angels. Yes, right. We can, let's see if we can take it up a notch. Shepherds. Yes, they've nailed it in the middle. Um, animals. Where are the animals? Yes, that's good, Jean. There's animal noises each time I talk about the animals. The wise men. Yeah, brilliant. And then finally, Mary and Joseph. <laughs> yes, brilliant. Excellent. Right. So we've just heard uh, about and seen the nativity of an angel. Angels. Yes, you've got to be listening. You've got to be listening. This is, makes everybody listen to what I say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's an angel appearing to Mary to let her know she'd been chosen to carry the Son of God. And then we have Mary and Joseph unable to find room at the inn. Then again, we have the angels appearing to the shepherds. And then we have the baby Jesus, um, born in some kind of stable or cave, surrounded by animals. And then we have the star that led the wise men to come and worship. Right, so there's, they, those words might appear a few times. What I am going to do is let the people who are stars um, uh, off the hook, because I'm going to talk about stars quite a lot in a minute, but we'll come back. There'll be another bit um, where we'll go through the nativity, and you need to keep your ears peeled. So we can find those accounts in the Bible, um, in two of the books in here, um, the Gospels of Luke and Matthew. And when you stitch it together, you get that story of the nativity. And for many of us, maybe we think that's the start of the Jesus story. But actually, this book, and I've had this one for ages, you can see it's held together uh, with tape, um, is all about the Jesus story. Uh, Part one, you might have heard it referred to as the Old Testament. There's 39 books in the Old Testament. Sets the scene um, from the creation of the universe and then the problems caused by humans wanting to do their own stuff. You might remember the story of Adam and Eve eating the apple from the tree that they were told not to eat from. And then we have uh, the journey of a a whole nation called Israel um, through many generations, and they went round and round in circles, and they had a troubled relationship with God. And through that, there were a number of times that God spoke through people to the Israelites to tell them about this Messiah that was going to come. And so all through the Old Testament, it points towards uh, Jesus and how he was going, God was going to restore the relationship between himself and humans. So the nativity that we've just seen is actually the start of part two, called the New Testament. And we have the birth of Jesus as a baby, and then he grew up to be a man. And so through part two, we follow Jesus's life and his ministry through those gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and it ends at Easter. Then we have, I guess, what you could call part three, which is all about the people who learnt from Jesus and followed him, his disciples, and that became the church, and how the church grew and spread out, and how they learned to be followers of Jesus. And finally, at the very end, we have, I guess, what you might call part four, 
And it's a description of what it will be like when Jesus returns. And so this morning, I want to just very briefly think about how all this fits together. And I want to start thinking about the star. So, yes, well done. You are listening. Right, you can have a rest for the next few times I say stars, because otherwise you'll be getting worn out. So, um, how many stars are there in our solar system? Anyone want to call out an answer? Ed? 3.8 quadrillion. Any other answers for how many stars in our solar system? Go on then. One. So we've got from one to 3.8 quadrillion. Right, well, the sun is probably the one star in our solar system. So all the planets go round that one star... But there is a theory that there may be a second star that becomes visible once every 32 million years. But I haven't seen it. So we're working on about one. So there's one star in our solar system. And our solar system makes up a galaxy called the Milky Way. Um, Does anyone know how many stars are in the Milky Way? Anyone got any ideas? Anyone else put their hand up? No, I'll tell you. There's estimated around 200 billion stars in the Milky Way. That's the galaxy that we are in. There's there's kind of a range of estimates from about 100 billion to 400 billion, um, but people talk about 200 billion, so we're going to work with that today. So 200 billion, um, we'll put that up on the screen. That is a two with 11 zeros. How long do you think it takes to count to 200 billion? Forever. That's not a bad guess. Anyone else got any ideas for how long it takes to count to 200 billion? Yeah? Cavell, what do you think? A century. Well, there are different ways to estimate it, and it depends whether you're allowed a break, whether you're allowed to go to sleep. Um, but if you count from 0 to 100, and you go, go fairly quick, but you know, sort of not total mumbling, it takes about 30 seconds to get to 100. Um, so then, but then the numbers get longer and longer if you're going to say it out loud. So if you're, by the time you've got to 999,999,999, it's taking you about five seconds to get each number out. And that's before we're getting to the hundreds of billions. Um, so we can get some fairly chunky estimates. So um, the next slide, does anyone know who this is? <laughs> Mr. Beast. So he apparently, he's a YouTuber for all of those uh, who are older than about 18 uh, in the room. Um, He once counted to 100,000 for one of his videos that took him 40 hours um, to get to 100,000. And that is when the numbers start to get longer. So we reckon to get to 1 million is about a month of hard, solid counting. Um, So to get from 1 million to a billion, that's 1,000 million, So we're getting up towards 100 years to get to the 1 billion. To get to 200 billion, we're looking at 20,000 years. And that's to count the number of stars just in our galaxy, the Milky Way. And any ideas how many galaxies are in the universe? Ed? You're counting them in your head. (laughs) Well, 11, well, the current estimate is 2 trillion. (laughs) So if you times 2 trillion by the 20,000 years or whatever, yeah, we're talking plenty of years. Um, And that's assuming all of the galaxies have roughly about the same number of stars. So actually, I don't think it really matters how long it takes to count. What we've got is this phenomenally vast universe that God created. And then within that, we've got these tiny things of amazing beauty just within our own planet. And at the start of this book, uh, this book of books, this basically a library, we've got Genesis, uh, which has these accounts of the creation of the world. And just the first few, few verses of the Bible, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty and darkness covered the deep waters, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. 
Then God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw that the light was good. Then he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness night. So that's right at the beginning of part one. And then we skip forward to part two that we've just seen in the nativity. As I said, it came about uh, from the accounts of Matthew and Luke. But there's also another account in the Gospels at the start of the book of John. And it's often read out at carol services, um, if you've been to carol services before. And it's quite an unusual and odd passage. And I remember I didn't really used to know what was going on. So I've got, uh, we're going to read uh, the beginning of chapter one of John uh, and split it up into two bits. And I've got it, taken it from a translation called the New Living Translation, which I think is a bit easier to understand. So it says, in the beginning, the word already existed. The word was with God and the word was God. Now I'm not going to go into great detail, but when it talks about the word there, it's talking about Jesus. So if we replace the word word with Jesus there, it says, in the beginning, Jesus already existed. Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The word, Jesus, gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. So we've got this creation at the beginning of this book where God created the world. Jesus was there. Jesus was instrumental to it. And now at the start of part two, God in the form of Jesus steps down into this world. So we're going to read a few more verses as it carries on. It says, he came into the very world he created. That's Jesus. But the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. So the word, Jesus, became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. And so the Christmas story and the nativity is all about the fact that Jesus is here. And one of the names that was given to Jesus is Emmanuel, which means God with us. So if we go back to the slide of the nativity scene, uh, you need to have your ears pricked up again. Um, That is what was going on right here in that stable with the animals around. That's why the angels... appeared to the shepherds and why the wise men came to worship because this was Emmanuel, God with us. You can have a rest now. Um, And it's really interesting because we've got the shepherds who were the poorest and probably the least educated in society and we've got the wise men who were the cleverest and most educated in society both invited to come and worship Jesus. And this whole story tells us something about how God sees the world so differently to the way many of us do or are conditioned to by our society. Jesus doesn't come as a king born into a palace, but to a poor family where Mary was unmarried when Jesus was conceived in humble surroundings away from home pushed to the side with no room in the inn, who had to then escape as refugees through Egypt. That is the God that is with us. That first nativity, Jesus was tucked around the back. You can imagine they were all going to Bethlehem for this census and uh, the town would have been really busy. That's why there was no room in the hotels. So there was all this busyness and he was shoved to the side which can be the same and true of all our Christmases, where we're so busy doing the food and the gifts and stressing about where we need to be, whether we're going to have a positive lateral flow test and not get there, wondering how to achieve a Christmas that looks like the adverts, that there's no room to let him in. He's tucked away, forgotten about. 
And then Jesus grew to become a man. He taught us more about the way God envisages the world. And he talked about it, and we get accounts in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John of where he talked about the kingdom of God coming. And it, that's really talking about how God thinks the world should be and how we should live in it. And again, it's really different to the way many of us live and our society is set up. He talked about the first being last. Jesus leads by serving, where love, justice, and compassion are at the core. Where Jesus hangs out with the most broken in the society, and he rebukes the ones who seek to oppress and lord it over others. That is the God that is with us. And we then head towards the Easter story, which you may be familiar with, where Jesus was again broken by those in power, humiliated, treated as the lowest of the low, but who was willing to die that we might know God, who broke down that barrier between us and God for good, as it was told in the Old Testament. And then he invites us all into his kingdom, whatever our situation, whatever we have done. All we need to do is accept the gift that he offers and we can become children of God. That is the God that is with us. And at the very end of Matthew, the parting words of Jesus to his disciples before he returned to heaven, he says, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So he stepped down as Emmanuel, God with us, at Christmas, and then when he leaves, he says, I will still be with you. He continues to be God with us. And then he tasks his followers with trying to establish this kingdom of God on earth. And you may remember the Lord's Prayer from when you were at school. And there's a line in it that says, Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. So we're to ask that this kingdom comes, but we're not only to ask. He taught that we should live that out. We shouldn't just, we should be the answer to our prayer, to be the people who live out love, justice, and compassion, that follow the examples that Jesus gave and taught, all the time knowing that God is with us. And then the very, very end of this book, the book of Revelation, we're taught that Jesus will come again. And that until that day, whilst we're trying to make the world more like the kingdom and we're trying to follow the way Jesus taught, it's never going to be fully established But one day, this is what it says uh, in the nearly the very last chapter of the Bible. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. And this is Jesus again speaking. And then he said to me, write this down, for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, it is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. Emmanuel, God with us. He will be with us always. Now, perhaps you think that all sounds very nice, but it sounds too far-fetched to be real. Maybe you've got questions. Well, did God really create the whole universe? How does that fit with science? Was Jesus real, or is it just a legend? And did he really die and rose again? Well, questions are absolutely fine. This morning, this is just a, a taster. We're really keen on questions here and next year we're going to be running something called Alpha and we're going to tell you a bit more about that in a moment and that will provide you with an opportunity to ask all those questions and to go a bit deeper and no question is off the table but today I want us to just think about that first Christmas the God who created this vast universe that we live in coming down to this planet we call home as a humble baby in ignored surroundings, 
so that we might get to see and fully know God. You were invited to come and meet with him, to see, to find out more, to be part of his family. And you don't need to have it sorted, far from it. He's here this Christmas, and whether you feel like the poorest of the poor, like the shepherds, or the most learned person in the room, like the kings, the invitation is for you to experience that those glad tidings of comfort and joy we sing about in the carol are for real. God really is with us.